crafting. We have a fridge, microwave, and sink for washing up. Uh, and all in all, our residents just really enjoy this room for a variety of reasons. Thank you for coming to class today. We've got a great speaker for you. Allison Manger Bikel is a registered dietitian and director of System Clinical Nutrition Quality and Compliance for Riverside Health System. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics from the University of Maryland and a Master of Health Administration from Mount St. Mary's University. She brings 30 years of experience and expertise in the area of food and nutrition and has provided lectures on a wide variety of topics over the years. We hope you enjoy the class. I was introduced. My name is Allison Major Weichel, and I am the Director of System Clinical Nutrition Quality and Compliance for uh, Food and Nutrition Services with Riverside Health System. Um, I thought it would be a great opportunity uh, to start off the year to talk about um, some great resources uh, that are available to you in making healthy food choices and start the year out right. So uh, just wanted to go through some basic uh, objectives. So during this, uh, this time together, I want you to, to be able to identify some basic nutrition concepts and components of nutrition, identify how nutritional needs change throughout the lifespan, review nutrition recommendations for a healthful diet, and then we're going to review some tools available through choosemyplate.gov to assist in analyzing current gaps in your daily intakes and recommendations for change. So if you have questions um, throughout this, this lecture, the, you can enter them into the chat. Um, and I'll try to keep an eye on it if uh, things are coming up and, and if you, um, you know, want me to address anything uh, or if I can address something to the group, please uh, take the, that opportunity. Usually there's a lot of uh, questions when it comes to, to nutrition. And I think after this past year, um, I think we've had a lot of challenges of shortages and lockdowns and, um, you know, things that are, were available. And, and I'm still finding that, you know, there's some challenges sometimes in, in finding products and variety and produce. And we certainly have felt it um, throughout Riverside and our food and nutrition services. We, we've had to deal as well with um, things that have gone on allocation or there's been shortages. And, uh, you know, I think we've just all tried to work together and um, do the best that we can. So now that we're hopefully coming on, on the backside of, of the pandemic, um, we're going to try to resume some sense of normalcy. So when we talk about basic nutritional components, protein, fat, vitamins and minerals, and then waters is always at the center of all of that. And what I find is that a lot of people have some confusion or questions regarding how these basic components um, react for the body. Why are they so important? Um, and, you know, there's a, just a lot of miscommunication about how we should be eating. Um, and I'm sure if you've um, seen many of the infomercials <laughs> recently or, you know, the, the ketogenic diet, you know, has popped up again and, you know, everything's about protein and now we're into plant-based, which is, which is awesome. Um, I just think it's important to understand the very basics of what our bodies truly need and, you know, be able to make more informed decisions uh, on, on how we're going to consume our meals. So when we talk about carbohydrates, the basics um, of what you want to think about are two different types of carbohydrate. We have complex carbohydrate and we have simple carbohydrates. And over the, the past few years, carbohydrates really have gotten kind of bashed and, you know, they're, they're bad and we shouldn't be eating them. Um, however, what everyone needs to realize is that carbohydrate breaks down into glucose or, or sugar, and that's what your body's fuel is. You know, I always tell people that's the, that's the gas that, that you put in your car, and if you don't put the gas in your body, if you don't put the carbohydrates in your body, you're not gonna feel, you're not gonna feel good. I mean, your, your brain, that's its primary source of fuel. But what you do need to understand is that not all carbohydrates are created equal. 
Um, so when we talk about com complex carbohydrates, that's your breads, your cereals, uh, rice, pasta, potatoes. Now I have dairy products and fruit, more so your whole fruits are more of your complex carbohydrate. And I say that mainly because it has more of the fiber. Um, and then dairy products because it has protein. When we talk about simple carbohydrates, sugars, honeys, soda, fruit juice, um, things that, that are going to break down much faster in the body than a complex carbohydrate. So when I say that not all carbs are created equal, um, like I said, all carbohydrates break down into glucose, which is needed for brain and body function. Um, and the way that carbohydrates affect your body is, you know, they're the first thing to be broken down. It starts in your, in your mouth and then into the stomach, and, and th it eventually gets broken down into glucose, which affects your blood sugar. So if you have a history of diabetes, you know all too well that if you eat pizza or spaghetti or a high carbohydrate meal, your blood sugars are going to be elevated. Um, but if you eat a, a mixed meal with um, that contains carbohydrates and proteins and fats, as we'll talk about, you'll notice that your blood sugars won't raise quite as quickly um, and drop as, as fast. So how does, how does that differ? So when we talk about carbohydrates, we want to make sure that we're eating um, whole grains. You know, it's the biggest thing that we've, we've heard about over the last couple of years is, is healthy whole grains, um, whole wheat pasta, whole wheat breads, brown rice instead of white rice. The difference being with those, number one, nutritionally, they're more complete because they've not been stripped down and had vitamins and minerals added back to them. But that fiber, um, slows digestion. So if it's staying in your stomach longer and it's slowing your digestion, you're not going to get hungry as fast. Your blood sugar levels aren't going to rise as quickly and as fast. Um, and then the fiber, of course, helps with digestion. So um, with that slower digestion, like it, like I said, does not raise your blood sugars as high. And um, we want to make sure that we're eating carbohydrates throughout the day. So um, we always talk about breakfast being the most important uh, meal of the day. You want to make sure that you're having carbohydrates, you know, one to two pieces of uh, whole grain toast or uh, a bagel or, you know, some kind of a complex carbohydrate, you know, a whole grain oatmeal, you name it. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're, con you're controlling your portions all throughout the day. So some people do better, um, you know, like for instance, I'm not a big breakfast eater. I always eat something, but I'm not a big breakfast eater. So, you know, the thought of going out and eating, you know, an omelet with all this toast and breakfast meats and things like that, it's not my thing. Um, but I do try to eat something, but I, I'm more of a five to six meal per day type of a person. So I try to spread those carbs out throughout the day so that you're getting those little bursts of energy. Um, to keep your blood sugar levels stable. And, and blood sugar is what your body reacts to, or I should say your hunger cycles are uh, a, a byproduct of how your blood sugar levels are. So if your blood sugar level is starting to drop, you haven't eaten for a while, or you didn't eat a really good complex uh, meal, as your blood sugar levels start to drop, you're gonna start to feel hungry. So, the way that we try to um, affect your hunger signals is to make sure that you're eating a mixed meal. So, for instance, at breakfast time, making sure that you're having some protein with your carbohydrate and maybe a little bit of fat. So, you know, maybe an egg with your whole grain toast and, and a teaspoon of, of butter or margarine. That's going to get you a lot further than a bowl of cereal, for instance, which is primarily carbohydrate. So, like I said, carbohydrates are very important. That's your brain fuel, if you want to think about it that way. So when we talk about proteins, a lot of times people consider protein as your energy. But it's more so, you know, protein is, is more to support your muscle and tissue growth and repair as opposed to energy. Remember I just said your carbohydrates, your energy, but your protein helps to stabilize your blood sugars. So where do we find protein? 
meat, chicken, fish, uh, seafood, eggs, cheese, dairy, uh, all contain protein. And then you have your tofu, your nuts, your seeds, and plant-based meat analogs. So a lot of these um, uh, meats, uh, I was just uh, trying to think some of the incognito and, and um, I'm trying to think of other, some of these newer brands that have come up. And, and I think we're going to continue to hear a lot about plant-based this over this coming year. It, it's, it's kind of the buzzword. It's the kale of, of 2021. Um, so again, it supports muscle and tissue growth and repair. Um, and as I stated previously, it will help to provide blood sugar stability. Um, so making sure that you're getting protein throughout the day, um, but watch your portion sizes. So a lot of people, you know, I always use the example of the boneless, skinless chicken breasts that you buy now are probably two to three times larger than what I remember they looked like when, you know, when I was growing up. So a typical um, chicken breast now, I would say, is between maybe six, you know, they're, they're closer to six to seven ounces, which is more so a daily allowance of, of the amount of protein that most of us need. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of more of the, you got to watch those portions um, of, of, those, of the protein and again, spread it throughout the day. The other thing we want to know about uh, proteins is that they do vary in their fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol content. So, you know, choosing lean meats, chicken, fish, um, you know, with the dairy, depending on how much you're consuming, you may or may not want to choose uh, a low-fat version or fat-free. Do know that nuts and seeds do, do contain a lot of... Um, healthy fats, you know, but you don't want to sit down and eat um, a whole can of cashews if you're trying to watch your weight. So <laughs> nuts um, and seeds do, do carry a lot of those healthy oils and healthy fats, but you want to make sure you're watching your portion sizes. Speaking of fats, um, butters, margarine, uh, oils, salad dressing, mayonnaise, um, what fats do in the body is they support cell structure and act as carriers and transport for fat-soluble vitamins, um, which are A, D, E, and K. So fat-soluble vitamins do get stored in the body. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not overdosing on those. Um, I think certainly vitamin D has, has played a role um, center stage over the last, I know I want to say five to eight years, because adults don't get enough. Um, I'm concerned about our children um, that may not be drinking their milk, they're not getting their sunshine, um, getting enough vitamin D that could potentially uh, increase the risk for deficiencies and osteoporosis. So um, vitamin K, a lot of people that if you're on um, a blood thinner, the vitamin K may be something that you've heard about because that does... Um, you know, thin the blood. So particularly we get that in our dark leafy green vegetables. Um, but it is, it is a fat soluble vitamin that, that is needed um, for the body. Fats, much like proteins, help to stabilize your blood sugars um, by slowing the digestion. So you, you may notice that after a, a high fat meal, it may make you feel more sluggish. Um, is in a lot of it, it's just because it stays in your stomach a lot longer. Um, and, you know, will slow that digestion that, that you uh, not going to get hungry, that's for sure. The other thing that we want to think about when we're talking about nutrition, and, and we'll talk about how to read this nutrition facts label, is not all uh, calories are created equal. So carbohydrate and protein each carry four, gram, four calories per gram, whereas if you see fat, fat calories um, are nine calories per gram. So that's why the recommendation is so much um smaller uh, for fat than your carbohydrates and protein. Um, with the carbohydrates, they are making up most of the calories in, in the typical American diet because we, we love our carbs. <laughs> so 
when you're looking at the nutrition facts label, the biggest thing that I, I try to um, encourage people to do is you want to start by at the very top, you'll see that it says nutrition facts and then serving size. That serving size is critical because all of those numbers that you see listed below are based on that particular portion size. So what I always tell people is when you look at the portion, compare that to how you would normally consume that product. So for instance, if cereal is listed as a one cup portion is, is what you're going to get those, you know, let's say, you know, that one cup is going to give you those 250 calories and 12 grams of fat. Um, do you really only eat a cup? Or if it's based on a half a cup, do you only eat a half a cup? And the exercise that I usually tell people to do to check this is get your measuring cup out, pour out a normal bowl of cereal. You know, if it's Cheerios or, I don't know, Frost or Frosted Flakes or whatever it is, pour it into your normal bowl, whatever your normal portion would be, and then measure it. Sometimes you're going to be surprised that you're doubling what the, you know, you're eating twice the amount of the, what the portion size that is um, listed on those nutrition facts labels. So the portion sizes are, are critical, or I should say the serving sizes. And then sometimes it'll give you a clue of how many servings you would get per container. If you normally ate the entire container full of product, then you double those numbers. So instead of 250 calories, you're eating 500. Um, instead of 12 grams of fat, you're getting 24. So, you know, pay attention to that, you know, and, and again, if you have diabetes and you're trying to um, keep track of your carbohydrates, um, you want to look at the total carbohydrate grams, and um, you know typically we we look at carbs in 15 gram increments. So each piece of toast might be 15 grams. So for that uh, nutrition facts label there on the right, where it lists 31 grams of carbohydrate, that would be the equivalent of eating two pieces of toast. So um, that is some good information that's there. Uh, dietary fiber is another thing that is important. Uh, the recommendation for, for adults is about 30 grams of fiber per day. And I would say that most um, adults fall way below that, that recommendation. So it's always good to take a look, you know, if you're starting to, to purchase those whole grain items, you know, brown rice, whole grain cereals, high fiber cereals, Take a look at, at how many grams of fiber because you may be surprised that, you know, maybe even in a, a product that says it's, it's healthy whole grain, it may only have two or three grams of fiber in it. So um, it's always good to know if, you, if, you, if it truly is a good source of fiber. Um, so if, uh, you know, if anybody has any questions about that, just, uh, again, feel free to, to put it into the chat. But those nutrition facts labels are truly um, your, your window into, is this really a nutritional product? Um, you know, uh, food companies are getting really good at putting, um, putting those uh, nutrition uh, shout outs, I should say, on the, the front or, you know, on the front label. So you're going to probably see plant-based, you're going to see healthy whole, uh, whole grain, um, but you really want to take a look at that nutrition facts label and see if it's true. So I'm getting some questions that are coming in. So um, first question is, what is better, soluble or insoluble fiber? They, they're, they're both good, but they're both um, important in a different way. So your soluble fibers are important for your bowel health. So when we think of things like the metamucils of the world, those are more of a soluble fiber. What they do is they absorb water as they're going through the, the GI tract. And as they absorb water, they swell and give, the, give your stools bulk. So that's how they help to um, help with your bowel function. Insoluble fibers are more like a I usually try to describe those as like a brush as it's going through the colon. So those insoluble fibers are acting as a, a as a broom to sweep um, 
the bad stuff basically out of your body. Um, so again, the soluble fiber helps to give the stool bulk um, to, you know, basically ease bowel movements. Uh, so if you have a history of diverticulosis, which is those pockets or pouches in your colon, the soluble fibers are great. Um, you have to be a little bit more careful um, about things like nuts and seeds and things like that. But the, the insoluble fiber, though, as well, helps to keep that from happening. You know, you, you'd want to have that um, clean. So, yeah, so as far as the soluble and insoluble, you, you definitely want both. Okay. Um, and then I have another question of how much uh, is cholesterol level affected by diet and how much is affected by other factors. So cholesterol, it, it really hasn't come up as much um, in, in literature recently. It was very, very big in the, you know, in the 1990s and um, we were very focused on, on cholesterol and, and the foods that we eat. Um, so it's a two-pronged question. So there are people that have, um, what we what we call familial meaning it, it runs in your family um, that you have issues with clearing cholesterol and triglycerides as well if you've if you've heard that um, so in those cases you do want to be careful with how much cholesterol you're consuming um, and uh, cholesterol is only found in animal products so meat chicken you know, eggs, cheese, dairy products. Um, you're not going to find it in margarine, but you will find it in butter because it comes from an animal. So what we want to make sure is that if you're consuming a, a healthful diet that's rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean meats, um, the, the fish, you know, and seafood, you um, you're doing the best you can to, to try to control your cholesterol. Um, you know, I, I think, again, it may run in the family. Um, you know, you may still have to take some type of medication. You know, that's something you definitely want to work through with your with your uh, physician or cardiologist. Um, because there there can be other factors, but you know, really trying to choose a healthful diet is is the best you can do on you know from that side. Um, and then I have another question: How does the keto diet affect HDL and LDL? I, you know, I, I'm not I I'm not a big fan of the keto diet just because it it restricts the healthier options that you know uh, that are the whole grains and some of the the fruits and the vegetables um the ldl you, you know i i don't know i i don't want to misspeak because i don't have a lot of the evidence-based um facts on on keto i know that ldl you can typically affect your ldl by choosing a healthful diet hdl is much more difficult um, to improve. So for those of you that may not be familiar with that, the HDLs are your good cholesterol. Those are kind of the cars that carry the, the bad fats away um, from the cells and, and it gets rid of them um, out of the body. The LDLs are the, the slugs. So um, we don't want a lot of LDL. Um, you know, so the that's why your your physicians may tell you to focus on trying to reduce your fat intake, um, your cholesterol intake. HDLs um, tend to respond better to exercise, um, and and again, a healthful diet. But it, it you may get don't get frustrated, I should say, if you're having trouble. Um, struggling to get those HDLs up. I think it's just as important to get the LDLs and, and control your cholesterol levels. All right, so uh, let's move on to vitamins and minerals. So vitamins and minerals, you know, vitamin C, all your B vitamins, um, thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, these are all essential to support all of the chemical reactions that occur in our body for normal functioning. They're, they're kind of the unsung heroes that we never even thought about. So, you know, when we think about the chemical reactions, sodium, potassium, magnesium, 
Um, those are all critical elements that are um, making your body work, basically, supporting your cell functions, supporting your um, neurochemical transmissions in your brain. You know, if we don't have those, those vitamins and minerals, your brain, you, that's when you're, you're start to um, not function as well, I should say. So your fat-soluble vitamins, um, vitamin A, D, E, and K, I talked about these previously. These are stored in the body, but they have to be repleted as they, they're used. So um, that's why you need to be a little bit more careful. In particular with vitamin A, um, there is a toxicity that's associated with vitamin A. I don't think we see it that often, and, and you have to really be taking large doses. But vitamin K um, can be important if, you know, it, it does thin the blood. So you do want to be careful with this. And, and I know I've uh, had a lot of patients. We have more patients that if you're on blood thinners, in particular Coumadin, um, the doctors used to tell you never to eat, you know, the, the dark leafy green vegetables. You can't eat salads. You, you know, there was just a lot of restriction. But now what we, what we usually will recommend to patients, um, if you are on Coumadin, that yes, you do need to be cautious with the dark leafy greens, your kale, your spinach, um, your salads. Um, but what's more important is that you keep your diet consistent. Um, and, and I always tell the patients that if you are on Coumadin, work very closely with your providers um, on this. And you know, as your levels get checked on a monthly basis, you want to make sure that the level is, is staying consistent. And I always tell, tell patients that if you're going to make a diet change, and I use the example of, um, you know, as the summer gardens start to grow, you know, if you're an avid gardener and you really love your, your salads and your, you know, dark leafy green vegetables, go ahead and talk to your, your provider about that and, and work through how you can incorporate those items into your diet because they may want to check your levels more closely. Um, but if you're going to consume it, don't do, you know, eat three cups of kale in one sitting. You want to do it in, in moderation and in conjunction with um, definite discussion with your providers just to make sure that if it is affecting your, um, your levels that, you know, you, they're, that you don't run into trouble with, with doing that. Okay, so as far as water-soluble vitamins, vitamin C, you know, like I said, your B vitamins, thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, B12, um, and then things like magnesium, potassium, and sodium must be repleted daily. Um, so let me say something about vitamin C. So, you know, this is always a big one that, you know, the more vitamin C we take, the more it's going to, you know, help us with our immunity and um, it, it's a cure-all for everything. However, vitamin C is excreted in through, through the kidneys on a daily basis. So if you um, consume or take mega doses of vitamin C, it, you may be wasting your money because it's, you know, you're going to excrete it through the urine on a daily basis. So it is important. We do want to make sure that we're getting adequate amounts of vitamin C. Um, but just be cautious uh, with, you know, with nutritional supplements uh, or vitamin and mineral supplements that, um, you know, discuss it with your pro provider again, because we want to make sure that it's, you know, you're not taking something that, you know, may harm you, number one, or that you could get excessive amounts. Um, so as far as sodium goes, again, sodium is, is a necessary element that we have to consume. We have to have enough of it. The problem is, is that we typically consume too much of it. Uh, the recommendation is about 2,400 milligrams per day or just about two to two and a half grams of, of sodium. So, you know, again, when we go back and look at see if I can go back to my nutrition facts label. When you look at how much sodium is in an item, you know, you want to think about that. So if it's, uh, and I'll use the example of soup. Canned soup a lot of times will it contain, you know, almost up to one gram of sodium per serving. 
So again, if you look at this label and it says that there's 900 milligrams of sodium per serving, and that's just a one cup portion size, and you tend to consume, you know, the whole can of soup, you're almost getting your whole day's worth of sodium just in that one meal. So, you know, do be careful and do pay attention to that. If, if you have a history of congestive heart failure, um, heart disease, kidney, um, you know, issues, or just in general, hypertension, high blood pressure, you know, be cognizant of your sodium intakes. So it's not just the salt shaker that certainly adds to it and compounds it. Um, but really look at what's in, the, you know, just in foods in general. Breads contain sodium. Baked goods contain sodium because of the baking powder and, and the salt that we add. Um, and then, of course, all of your other bacon, you know, sausage, hot dogs, anything that comes in a can, box, or a jar is what I pr pretty much tell people. So the more that you can control that by cooking from scratch, using fresh fruits and vegetables, um, your whole grains, unprocessed meats, um, that's going to be much more, um, you know, health, healthy for you to control your sodium intake. And another question of, uh, do you have any a recommendation for a daily multivitamin? You know, I tell people just just go with the basics, <clears throat> and and it, you know don't need to mega dose on things. If your provider has recommended that you supplement with something, um, you know again discuss that with them. But if you are generally healthy and you know just really want to feel like you have an insurance policy on your nutrition, then just get a general multivitamin. Um, you know, you can get a generic vitamin. You just want to make sure that it's a reputable source and, um, you know, it could just covers the bases, basically. <coughs> and I had another question. How does two and a half grams convert to teaspoons? So, oh, gosh. I might have to go back. I'd, I probably would have to go back and, and look that up. Um, but I want to say one to two teaspoons per day um, is is plenty. <laughs> um, but I'd have to look that one up. I, I don't want I don't want to misspeak because I don't have the facts right in front of me. I have another question about the nutritional value of a glass of wine. So, depending on the size of the glass. <clears throat> a four ounce portion of wine, I want to say, and again, this is totally off the top of my head. Alcohol contains seven calories per gram, and I want to say maybe 120 calories per four ounce portion, um, but I'd have to fact check myself on that one. Um, <clears throat> is there a nutritional value? Um, I think that's more so in the antioxidant uh, value that has been put out there for red wines. Um, you know, again, I think everything in moderation. Um, discuss that with your, your provider as to, you know, is it appropriate or not appropriate based on any medications you may take or any um, health issues that, that you may have. So I hope that answers, answers that question. All right. Water. We never get enough water. Um, Americans are not good water drinkers. I have to say that. Um, water is absolutely essential for life. Um, and I usually tell people, you know, don't assume that because, um, you know, your iced tea or your juice, you know, it does contain water. There's no substitute for just good, you know, plain water. Foods do contain water. <laughs> Excuse me, I was I I'm gonna have to hydrate. <laughs> we have to get sufficient quantities um, to keep our bodies hydrated and more importantly to keep our fit kidneys functioning properly. Um, you know, I tell people to be very careful if if um, you know, especially young people now, you know, they're they they're adding all these protein powders and everything's high protein, you know, eating large quantities of, of meats and you know it kind of goes back to the keto question, which is high protein, high fat. Um, when you consume all that protein, it's it 
because protein is, is um, broken down and cleared through our kidneys. Um, most of the time, you know, your kidneys will do just fine, but it may come to the point where it can stress, um, it can stress the kidneys. So you really want to make sure that you are consuming adequate amounts of water um, to help to process the higher protein and, and also be, be kind to your kidneys and making sure that it's flushing the nitrogen, which is, which is the byproduct of, of uh, protein digestion. <clears throat> um, so, you know, making sure that you're getting a minimum of six to eight glasses of water a day um, is preferred, uh, you know, especially in, and maybe even more than that if you're exercising um, and eating a high protein diet. So, uh, again, if you've been told that you need to restrict your fluid intakes because of renal, you know, kidney failure or congestive heart failure, follow the guidelines that you've been provided by your physician or um, your uh, practitioner. Alrighty. Some more questions coming in. How does drinking black coffee affect daily water intake? So coffee does act as a diuretic. <clears throat> so as you know, you know, the more coffee you drink, the more trips to the bathroom, right? So you do want to be careful with the amount of coffee, especially, you know, regular, you know, regular coffee just because the, of the caffeine. But I would say probably for every cup of coffee that you drink, you should probably drink, you know, an equivalent of water, if not more. Um, to offset the diuretic effect of that. And um, question about drinking mineral water. Um, I guess it would depend on what minerals are in it. It's probably not enough that it would do any harm. Um, but I'd again, I'd have to look at the labels and see what is contained and what, what are the minerals. Um, probably not going to do any harm, but I would talk to your physician about that. Um, and also, how about flavored seltzer, no artificial sweeteners, um, etc. Yeah, I like the, fl the flavored seltzers, especially the ones that are not sweetened, um, I think are a good alternative because I think the lack of flavor in water is what turns most people off. Um, to, you know, that they may not drink as much water. And so having the flavored ones are great. Um, I don't have a particular problem with um, artificial sweeteners. Uh, I know a lot of people have concerns about that. I, I just say, you know, everything in moderation. You know, I don't have a problem with diet sodas unless you're drinking 20 of them a day. <coughs> um, honestly, you really shouldn't even be drinking more than one or two a day. So, um, you know, I, I think... It, I don't count those types. I, I would say the flavored seltzers, um, I would count as water. Um, so does I would not. Uh, again, even though they may be um, caffeine-free, sugar-free, the zeros, uh, all of that, I don't, I don't consider that um, adequate to hydrate. Um, so I hope that answers that question. All right. <clears throat> All right, so any more questions about hydration before we move on or vitamins, minerals, macronutrients, meaning carbo carbohydrate, protein, and fat? <clears throat> All right, so let's move into nutritional needs across the lifespan. Oh, I just got a question about calcium. <clears throat> so calcium, not quite sure one in particular, I mean, it is a necessary component for the bone strength. And a curious thing about calcium is at this point in our lives, I, you know, I'm assuming we, we've got all adult learners here, that we are only able to um, deposit calcium into our, what I call it our bone bank or our calcium bank in our periods of growth. So by the time we are in our late teens to early 20s, um, that's really the, the, the 
body's ability to store calcium. That's why we make it so um, important that during child, infancy, childhood, you know, the troubled teens years and, and young adults, that they really need to focus on consuming their dairy products or, or a calcium fortified, calcium and vitamin D fortified um, if, they, if they can't tolerate dairy products because that's their only time to be able to make those deposits in, into the bones and, and into the body. <clears throat> After that point, the reason why we still encourage everyone to consume dairy or calcium or supplement if you have to is because as the body needs calcium it's going to be taking it from your bones so that's how if we've not been good stewards to continue to to keep the calcium bathing our bones by consuming it on a daily basis the body will continue to deplete that calcium out of your bones and, and a good um, way to explain this to um, pregnant mothers is in this is just general nutrition it, it, or general in it, for pregnancy is that the baby typically will not suffer if their diet is not nutritionally adequate other than probably growth um, you know the, the calories but they're going to take from the mother um, you know the baby because they need so much um, support for bone growth they're going to take calcium from the mother for their growth, but then that's going to leave the mother with a, um, a deficit. So <clears throat> same thing as we're in, in adulthood, if we're not consuming those dairy products or cons you know, taking our calcium supplement, if that's what's been recommended, that's how we end up with osteoporosis as we age. So that could be, um, you know, fed up if we really didn't make a good deposit in our childhood years. So, um, that's that's why calcium is so important, and calcium is another one of those that's that's a critical element for a lot of the um, electronic signals that that occur in our bodies. So it is necessary. Uh, let's see. I have another question. Is it true that white liquors without added calories from mixes don't raise blood sugar? I would say, so this is talking about, I guess, vodka, gin, um, any of the clear liquor. If it's not mixed with anything, yes, it will not affect your blood sugars, um, but it will be stored as fat. So, again, not recommended, um, you know, in any excessive quantities for sure. Um, but if you have a history of diabetes, I, again, this is a big one that I would be discussing with your, your, uh, either your endocrinologist or your, your physician or provider um, before consuming alcohol. Another question, would I recommend whole 2% or skim milk? Um, I think if, if your normal weight, um, you know, probably 2% or, or skim milk, uh, really the only time we recommend whole milk or what some people refer to as vitamin D milk is in childhood um, up until the age of two. Uh, we usually recommend whole milk. Um, or if someone is having issues with not getting adequate calories or um, is losing weight, then we may recommend whole milk or, or a, whole, a whole milk uh, product like whole milk yogurt, cottage cheese, etc. But for most adults, skim or fat-free milk or 1% is, is typically the recommendation, but 2% is okay. If, if it'll get you to drink the milk, <laughs> then use the 2%. And another question, given that calcium isn't deposited beyond young adulthood, what are dietary recommendations to present or, or prevent or help with osteoporosis? Oh, again, fact-checking fact me again. I'm trying to remember what the recommendation is. Um, It is escaping me completely. I, I want to say 1,200 milligrams, but don't don't hold me to that. I'd have to go back and verify um, the di dietary recommendations on that. Um, but typically, for um, older adults, up up to three glasses of milk or three calcium servings should be adequate to meet your calcium needs. Um, but again, I'd have to go back and, and verify that for sure. 
All right, so again, I was mentioning a little bit about nutritional needs across the lifespan. So obviously, infancy have the highest nutritional needs to support growth and development in that first year. Um, usually after the first year, um, that one between one and two, their needs aren't as high. Um, however, you know we we still want to make sure that uh, you know that that they're getting adequate nutrition. Um, that they're you know of course breastfeeding is always recommended in infancy. So if you have grandchildren or you know um, your your own families that you know are. are raising young children, it is mission critical <laughs> to make sure that they're really um, making sure that the in infancy they're getting those needs met. Toddlers to preschool, um, a little more challenging. They typically are, are picky eaters. They really don't need as much. I think the biggest struggle here is a lot of parents give them portions that um, are, are larger than what would be recommended. They don't need as much so uh, I'll use the example of, um, I think the, the worst thing ever created was um, big kid meals. You know, when McDonald's came out with the big kid meals, it used to be that, you know, when you got chicken nuggets, the, um, the happy meal was, I think, four chicken nuggets. Of course, it had the French fries and, you know, you could get soda or juice or milk or whatever. Um, then they came out with these big kid meals and now they've got these mega packs and, um, you know, a, a toddler to a preschooler does not need, you know, six chicken nuggets or eight chicken nuggets. It's just too much. Um, you know, so it, and I think a lot of it is because they think, you know, at that age they're growing. Then they are still growing, but just be underst understand that their needs aren't as high as they were in infancy. Um, but that is a perfect time to get that dairy in them because a lot of times they will eat cheese. They will eat, you know, they'll drink their milk. Um, you know, get the, the small portions of proteins in them if you can. It's typically a fight for the vegetables, but you just keep putting in a putting in front of them. And in my household, I had five kids, and um, we had no thank you bites. You know that I would make them. Um, you know, at least try try things. So uh, and and really laying that foundation of good nutrition early on, it does tend to make them better eaters as they get older. Um, for school aged, um, you know, really trying to again encourage that well balanced diet with small frequent meals and snacks um, to help maintain brain function and energy. Teens, uh, what a challenge! I still have two two teenagers at home. Um, for some, you know, it's it's a matter of the portion control. Um, that's the critical time to make sure that they're making good nutrition choices because they may have a little bit more freedom um, out there and um, you know, so really kind of as as a as a mom, you know, that's kind of our last ditch effort to try to, to get pack that nutrition knowledge in to them. Um, from young adulthood into adulthood, our, our nutritional needs start to decline. So, you know, early 20s and 30s, you may not notice it as much. But, but by the time you're getting into your mid to late 30s and 40s and definitely into your 50s, um, you know, or I, I use the example, too, of, um, you know, you had a, somebody who was really, really active in college or in their young adult years, and, um, you know, now they're out of school or um, they're getting into their work routines and they're just not as active and they just start packing on the pounds. You can't eat like you did when you were younger. You have to cut back on your portion sizes. Um, and that's just kind of the case as we get older. Um, so the biggest thing that happens naturally as we age is we start to lose muscle mass. So as your muscle mass n naturally declines, muscle is what burns. That's that's your energy burner. Um, that's where all your mitochondria are that create your um, your energy. So as we lose muscle mass, in particular, as we get you know 65 and above, as we get older, we lose more and more muscle. <clears throat> in particular, women that if we're not trying to maintain that muscle mass, our nutritional needs really start to decline. So that can mean you either gain weight, okay, if you don't change your eating habits, or what we see, especially in advancing age, is that, you know, the, they start to eat less and less. As you eat less and less, 
you're not getting all those nutrients that are recommended <clears throat> and nutritional deficiencies can occur. So as we age, you know, you have to kind of ebb and flow to what your needs are. Um, <clears throat> but that may mean that, you know, that may necessitate that nutritional supplement. Um, you have to really be careful to make sure you're getting everything that you need. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Um, <clears throat> 1,200 milligrams of calcium is the RDA for, for calcium. I was in the back of my mind, but I didn't want to just state it. So um, I appreciate you adding that. So 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day is the recommendation. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so another comment. Some people are experiencing experiencing pandemic weight gain. Absolutely. Um, as we've been, you know, hunkered down in our homes or, um, you know, just not getting out as much and, <clears throat> and we're bored. You know, I, for a while there, you couldn't buy flour or yeast. Everybody was making bread. <laughs> I think we were, everybody was just trying to do anything and everything to, to combat the boredom. Um, you couldn't buy bread either. I think that was missing. Uh, right now, there, I, I'm I'm dairy challenged. I'm not sure what's going on with that. I haven't really heard, but very oftentimes the the milk um, shelves are empty. Um, so you know, the biggest way to combat the the weight gain is you know try to stay active. Try to keep your mind active. Um, you know, get out and take a walk. Maybe not right now when it's icy because I don't want anybody falling um, <clears throat> but you do want to make sure that you're getting some some exercise doing some things to um, you know pick up a, a hobby or you know something go clean out your, clean out your junk drawer you know there's a lot of things that you know we may not think to do but it, it takes your mind off of being bored which then take tends to make people want to snack um, so I think after we get through this this winter, uh, really looking for you know that ability to get out and take walks. Um, not quite sure where you know if you're at Warwick Forest or if you're at a facility or if you're in a community that has a gym. Not quite sure where we are with that with COVID. Um, but if you are able to uh, you know attend exercise classes or join you know the Y or join a gym, um, you know getting out there and getting some exercise would help to. Um, stave off any more weight gain. And I have one more comment. Can a 60 year old turn what is left of their poor muscle development around, <clears throat> or does one give up? I don't think you should ever give up. Um, you know, I think that would be a question for a physical therapist um, about muscle development <clears throat> or muscle function. Um, but we do want to preserve as much as we can because as muscle mass declines or as we become less active, you become a higher fall risk. So, um, I, you know, I think if you have a concern about, you know, muscle or weakness um, or poor development, um, talk to your provider about that and see if they want to recommend that maybe you have a physical therapy assessment to see if there's something that, you know, you can do to strengthen that. All right. I want to watch my time because I want to get to this. Uh... All right. So again, the biggest thing to think about, and this is the you know the old food guide pyramid. <clears throat> that we really want to make sure that you're choosing a wide variety of foods. Um, take a daily multivitamin or mineral supplement as needed. Um, I don't say that blanket as a you know blanket statement that everybody should take that, but I think if you're trying to eat healthy. Um, you know, you should be able to cover most of your bases. But if you want to take a multivitamin just to cover anything that you feel you're concerned about, that should be fine. All right. So I wanted to share, um, hang with me here. I got to get through some clicks to see if I can share the dietary guidelines. It should take a second. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. So I just wanted to bring this up because the dietary guidelines are what is current. Um, and basically here in this bullet point number two <clears throat> is to follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage. So again, trying to, to, to get all those foods in that fit. Um, 
customize and enjoy nutrient dense food. What is a nutrient dense food? That means that you want to make every bite count. So I don't consider a cookie a nutrient dense food. I think it's a it's fine. <laughs> you know, I you know every once in a while I love my sweets. Um, but you really and especially as as we age, we want to make sure that we're making every bite count as much as possible. So, you know, be cognizant of those what we call empty calories. So even though juice is high in vitamin C for, you know, and potassium, it's still kind of an empty calorie because it, it breaks down so quickly in the body. So, you know, although a, a portion size of juice a day or one or two portions is, is fine, we don't want to be drinking it all day long um, because it's, it's taking up valuable calories that you could be putting nutrient dense foods in your body. Um, let me just think here. So down to number three, <clears throat> some of the key recommendations are limit added sugars to less than 10% of the calories, limit saturated fats to less than 10%, limit sodium intake to less than 2,300 milligrams. I think I said 24, but so 23 and limit alcohol. So let me unshare this. Let's get back. I want to make, I'm trying to pay attention to my time because we're going to get short on time here. Mackenzie, can you bring my um, PowerPoint back up? There we go. Yeah, there's just a little bit of a delay as we click through our screens. So in, in conjunction with the dietary guidelines, we have this Choose My Plate, which is it kind of replaced the uh, Food Guide Pyramid from you know a decade ago. So the thing you want to focus on, and this is something so easy to do in your da daily life, is to make half your plate um, focused on fruits and vegetables. So when, and I'm not, I'm, you guys probably can't see my cursor, but um, if you see the left side of that plate, you have fruits and you have vegetables, that's taking up half of your plate, okay? So um, you really want to think about that. <clears throat> um, you know, my typical plate, vegetables are probably half of my plate because <laughs> I love vegetables um, and try to get at least two servings of, of whole fruit in daily um, and at least three servings, at, three, at least three half cup servings of vegetables. You know, I, I always tell people you can't eat enough vegetables. Um, you want to make at least half of your grains whole. So you've got your grains up there at the top right corner. And you notice that it kind of outweighs the protein. Protein is probably the smallest portion on that plate. So making at least half of your grains whole. So that means if you are consuming six um servings of grains per day, three of them should be whole grain, all right? Vary your pro protein routine. That means choose a, a wide variety of lean proteins. Um, like I said, going the meatless versions um, of uh, plant-based is, is really up and coming. Lots of more options. Um, and definitely trying to choose more uh, fish, fatty fish, like salmon. Um, is is they're really recommending at least two servings a week and then choose low fat or non-fat dairy products <clears throat> uh, really quickly i'm just going to go through this so you should aim for a minimum of five servings per day of fruits and vegetables that would be a medium-sized piece of fruit or a half cup of cooked vegetables Think about color, eating through the rainbow. This was another um, campaign from several years ago. Um, gosh, that's probably been 10 years ago. Of making sure that you're eating a wide variety of colors. Um, so, you know, those dark leafy greens, things like broccoli, different colored peppers, sweet potatoes and carrots. Those orange colored foods are ones that we tend to not get a lot of. Those are our vi high vitamin A and vitamin C um, fruits and vegetables. And then, of course, all of your, um, your whole fruits. <clears throat> These are high in fiber, antioxidants, and phytonutrients. So things like tomatoes have a lot of lycopene. Um, I'm trying to remember that. I've done that lecture years and years ago. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, but the more colors that you consume, the more phytonutrients you're getting, which are, are helpful for you. Try to steam or stir fry rather than um, boil. <laughs> and 
<clears throat> try to incorporate them into the main entree. So instead of always thinking we're having chicken for dinner, or we're having, um, I don't know, salmon, you know, think of mixed grains. So if you see a lot of those whole grain bowls are getting very popular, things like, like quinoa and farro and all those whole grains with lots of vegetables and then just lean proteins, that's a good healthy way to, um, to think about eating. As far as your grains, six to eight servings per day and, you know, a slice of bread, a third of a cup of rice. The portions are not big, not typical, you know, United States, you know, types of portions. Whole grain breads and pastas. Here's some other types of whole grain um, varieties that are available. Whole grain high fiber cereals are another good addition. Proteins, we've talked about this, you know, don't forget your, you know, lean meats, protein and fish, beans, seeds, legumes, plant-based alternatives. Um, and this was one of the recommendations was to aim for eight ounces of seafood per week. So that would be typically two portions, I would say. Um, dairy products consume at least three cups per day. We've talked about that. Fats, oils, and sweets, um, you know, again, you want to limit your sweets. You know, fats are necessary. Just be careful with them. Um, a lot of times I get the question about, you know, um, coconut oil is real popular right now. Um, I, I, the jury's kind of out on that one. I, I haven't been able to really look at the literature to see, you know, I don't think it's going to hurt you. It used to be that when we talked about coconut oil, that was, you know, high saturated fat. Um, but again, I think any oil in, in moderation is, is fine. All righty. So choose my plate. I really wanted to show you this tool. <clears throat> again, let me share. All right, so while that's coming up, I'll answer some more of these questions really quickly. Um, can eating chicken increase arthritis pain? How about nightshades, especially white potatoes? Um, so, and, and asking about white flour and sugar, I, you know, I think there's some, some schools of thought about in, inflammatory um, types of foods. And I think it's very individual. You know, again, you can do some some good Google searches on inflammatory diets. I think you just want to be careful, um, making sure that it's a reputable source. Um, you know, and again, I'm not an expert on that, so I, I don't want to misspeak. Um, okay. Had a question about how important is hummus. Hummus is great. Um, you know, that's made from chickpeas and, and tahini. It's got some good fats. It's got fiber, um, some of your B vitamins. So, you know, hummus, hummus is a good alternative if you are looking for a meatless option for proteins. Um, and then another question, plant-based products, any specific ingredient to look for or making my own? Um, what is the best plant? So I, I think the plant-based alternatives are great. Um, just be careful because even the, the, like the, the plant-based burgers that are out there contain a good amount of fat. So, you know, do your, do your due diligence. It, it's, it's a great alternative. I love them. Um, but don't be fooled to think they're going to be lower in calories and lower in fat. You know, I think using, um, you know, I always have a huge supply of, of canned beans, um, you know, in my, in my pantry that I use to make, you know, meatless chilies and, you know, I put beans in everything. I love them. Um, so those are also a nice alternative to add and they're high in fiber. So another question, this is a good question. Are plant-based proteins complete proteins? I would say most of them that they're producing in, in, you know, in a combination, should be a, almost a complete protein, especially if they're soy-based. Um, <clears throat> if you're doing it at home, you may need to, you know, it's good to combine your nuts and your seeds 
in along with your beans um, in order to get the complete protein. So there's some good um, books out there that you can can look at or you know good cookbooks and things that that do have that balance. So I wanted to show you um, this is from my myplate.gov m y p l a t e dot gov is an excellent website. So it it takes you through a lot of different resources um, that you know if you want to take take this quiz. It's a really kind of a good. It takes you down. It's it's lengthy. I want to say it's maybe ten or more questions that are specific to you, and then they actually give you recommendations on. Um, you know how you could make changes to your diet, how much you need to to consume, um, you know how to eat healthy. So um, I was hoping to be able to show you this and be able to click through it, um, but this is definitely a website that is very worth going in. And you know, as long as you're you know somewhat tech savvy, which I think most people are at this point, um, is just go in and start clicking in these different tabs, the eating healthy, the different life stages, the resources. Um, there's just a lot of good information in there. It talks about, you know, all of what I just really briefly went through on, on portion sizes and, and balance and, and why things are important in the diet. So it's definitely worth um, a, a good look. Um, it is a reputable source. Um, and I don't have the that one up right now, but the food, it's FNIC, Food and Nutrition Information Council, I think. FNIC dot, oh, I'm not sure if that's a dot com, a dot org. I, I'm not sure, but that's also another good source as well. So <clears throat> I stopped sharing this. All right. So that's the myplate.gov. And I wanted to, um, I just brought this up. <clears throat> this is from Riverside um, Fitness and Wellness Center. This is the dietitian that um, is associated with wellness. She's doing a program coming up, uh, actually this week, this next week, I should say, that is rooted in wellness. So I wanted to just put that this up if anybody is interested. Um, it looks like it's going to be a great program um, to talk about basic nutrition like I did today. Um, how to create a well-balanced diet, create SMART goals, and then, you know, addressing any barriers to change. <clears throat> so I think it would be a worthwhile program if you're interested. Um, so I'll leave that up for a minute if you, um, you know, want to write down any of that information. So that's about it for today. I'm, I'm coming up on time. Um, any last-minute questions, certainly enter them in the chat. But I appreciate your um, attention and, you know, and all the good questions. You, you really, um, I could tell this audience is, is uh, <clears throat> really thinking about good nutrition and, and health and wellness. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I am prayerfully hopeful that, 2021 is going to be a much better year and and you know I think it's given us a lot of um, of pause to think about our health and our wellness and you know how we can make improvements moving forward and um, all right <clears throat> okay well I thank you all so much um, <clears throat> and that is uh, I put my email address in there in case there are any <clears throat> any questions um, after this lecture. I appreciate your attention.